Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my speech today is going to be uh, quite simple. I'm going back to the basics. Uh, everyone is talking about AI, large language models, uh, Django, Fast API, libraries and frameworks. Uh, and I'm going back to the basics. I'm uh, going to talk about the object-oriented programming, the, uh, the absolute foundation of your, um, of your code. And It's fine. Anyway, um, anyways, and uh, I think uh, the basics are no longer uh, talked enough about, and uh, I want just to signify that uh, the way you write your code is the most fundamental part. Uh, frameworks or libraries are not going to fix that for you. Okay, let me ask you one question. Uh, what is the reason why uh, libraries frameworks or cloud even exists? And the answer is very simple and there is only one and only one answer. It is to make you more productive, is to make you produce more and faster. And there is uh, probably number one productivity killer is your bad code. And as I said before, uh, no framework no library, no cloud, not even the magical chat GPT is going to save you if your code is garbage. So what is bad code? Usually I define bad code as the one that is hard to understand and hard to maintain, therefore hard to test and hard to scale. And the problem with object-oriented programming is it lets you write a lot of that bad code in order for you to look clever, right? Uh, I've done this myself, and I think uh, in the audience there are many people that have done this as well. You have, let's say, a feature to implement or something to fix, and the way you do this is through five layers of abstraction, one line code that does 50 different actions and so on. And yeah, you look very smart, especially against your colleagues when your colleague looks at the code and says, oh, okay, I don't understand this, can you explain it to me? And then you feel very smart. Yeah, I'm smart and, and you're stupid. Uh, so that's, that's the problem with object-oriented programming. It is very easy to look smart uh, abusing it. However, and I think this is the most important slide of my presentation uh, for you to take away, is that being smart in software development is actually stupid. You don't want to be smart, you won't want to be clever, you don't want your solutions to be clever, you want your solutions to be simple, right? And let's talk a little bit more about object-oriented programming and uh, the way it allows you to be clever, smart, and uh, these are probably three uh, founding uh, pillars of object-oriented programming. It's abstraction, inheritance, and poly polymorphism. Uh, they really make your code look very sophisticated, complex, and you really look smart uh, using these uh, tactics. So let's look uh, at some samples of code. Um, I tried to write a sample application and I tried to show uh, the abstraction, the inheritance, and the polymorphism in one file. Um, so in the very beginning, uh, we have uh, an abstract class called animal. The reason it is abstract because it doesn't make sense for us to have an animal as an instance, right? Animals do not exist in the world. Cows exist, humans exist, and cats exist, but not animals. It's, it's a trait, it's a property, right? That's, that's, why it is, um, that's why it's abstract. And supposedly, let's say, every, um, every animal has, has some sort of sound. And that is why we have an abstract method sound, which forces you to implement that method whenever you inherit it. Um, okay, so this is the first example. Uh, we have the abstraction. Now moving to the middle uh, code, we have a couple of implementations, the cow and the cat. Uh, they, both, they both inherit the animal abstract class. And in the object-oriented uh, way, when you inherit something, it means that you are that thing. So for example, if a cow uh, inherits animal, you can say a cow is an animal. And since we have an abstract method, 
uh, we need to uh, override or implement the sound uh, method, meaning that the cow goes moo and the cat goes meow. And lastly, the polymorphism part, uh, the, the very uh, shiny thing in object-oriented programming is that uh, the function, the last, the last function here, uh, it makes your animal to make a sound, right? And uh, the reason why I can pass uh, the instance of a cow and the instance of a cat to that uh, make sound function is due to polymorphism and uh, because both cats and cows are animals. Now, one interesting thing, uh, and it's kind of a side effect of, of this um, inheritance, is that you see on the last two lines, I have created a cat instance, and obviously cat instance has a method sound. Yeah, so far so good. But apparently, cat instance is also, uh, also has is animal method. And when you look at the cat definition, uh, there is no uh, method is animal. Where does it come from? Obviously, it comes from inheritance from the uh, animal abstract class. And this is where it becomes, uh, uh, things become a little bit weird. It's like a double-edged sword, right? Um, you kind of have a class definition, and it's yet not complete because of the inheritance. So if you want to understand fully your code, now you need to go in all those classes that you inherit to understand how they work, what methods they provide, what, uh, uh, what variables they have, and in which context uh, those functions work. So it's, again, like a double-edged sword. On one way, you're decluttering your code. On the other way, now you need to go deeper into your source code or other libraries to better understand how things work. And the probably uh, <laughs> the worst example of polymorphism abstractions and inheritance is design patterns, absolute garbage. And uh, the, the worst thing is that universities teach you that. I, I, don't, I don't know if they still do, but at least uh, when I uh, went to university, uh, they did teach all of the singletons, factories, uh, chain of responsibilities and all that other stuff. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, all the design patterns actually, the way I look at them is they try to make your code look clever and address some high scale issues that very rarely um, arise. And uh, the way I see them, it is in unnecessary complication of your code. I've been developing uh, projects for more than a decade, uh, never found a reason to use any of the design patterns. Okay, and uh, I tried to give you one example, and the worst example I could come up with is abstract factory design pattern, like horrible stuff. Um, so, what you're, uh, so what we're trying to do, we're trying to create some kind of um, a localizer or a translator uh, functionality. Um, so how do we do that? Firstly, we have on, on the left side here, we have an abstract class localizer and it forces us uh, to implement the localize method whenever we inherit. And then we create a bunch of localizers, the French localizer, Spanish localizer, and the English localizer. And supposedly they have their own dictionaries um, inside. It's self.translations and then you have a dictionary. Okay, so far so good. Now, this is where the magic comes. Now, in order for you to create those instances, uh, you say, okay, I'm going to create them using factories. And uh, to make everything more abstract, you say, okay, I will create, create a localizer factory, the abstract class of localizer factory. And it will create this, uh, and it will have this one method, create localizer, and all, all the specific factories will, help, will have to implement that one. So what you do, you create French localizer factory, Spanish localizer factory, and English localizer factory. And uh, all of them uh, consequently return French localizer, Spanish localizer, and English localizer. And after all these fancy definitions, uh, this is how you uh, use your code. Firstly, you create a specific uh, localizer factory. 
Um, then you call create localizer, which returns a localizer instance. And lastly, you call a localize method on that instance. Okay. And now you may say, well, this is, this is a bad example. This is an unnecessary complication. Like, why would you do that? And I just want to um, underline here that it is a stripped down version of the uh, abstract factories. Uh, there are usually more methods involved, usually more variables, more parameters involved, and uh, classes or functions that use the factories. They usually utilize the polymorphism, so you can uh, supply any of the factories, and so on and so forth. So, so you have a lot of layers of abstraction here, and um, it is very weird when you try to remember the last slide. I don't even remember what the last slide was about. Okay, so I'm done ranting about the object-oriented programming. I'm done uh, uh, trash talking about uh, polymorphism and abstractions and inheritance. Um, so let's see how we can make our code a little bit more simple. And uh, uh, the best source of inspiration for me is functional programming. I don't like the functional programming, I don't like to go all in into functional programming because it's, it's a weird thing on its own with all the arrow functions and, 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 and no-name functions and, and things like that. But there are some very nice ideas about functional programming that we can really uh, port to object-oriented programming. And these ideas are immutable data, no side effects in your functions, Separation of data and functions. And lastly, uh, functional code is usually easier to read and understand because you get what you see, right? There is no inheritance and then uh, hidden, hidden variables, hidden uh, functions, and so on. Okay, so let's jump uh, straight to examples. One thing I absolutely adore and absolutely love in Python is frozen data classes. If you don't know what are frozen data classes, well, uh, you should, and you should start using them instead of uh, your ordinary uh, class definitions. Uh, there are two reasons. One reason is it makes uh, the class definition itself very nice. You, don't, you no longer need the uh, constructor the, not, not the constructor, the initializer method, the, the init, uh, and then you know you pass some parameters, then you initialize internal variables, you do the assignment and, st and, and stuff like that. None of this is required for data classes. You just have, like in this example, name, color, breed, and lifespan. You define what, what their type is, and this is already a constructor, right? Like, uh, make no mistake, these are not Static definitions, these are dynamic, normal definitions as you would have in, a, in your init method. And the other thing I really like about data classes is that they can be frozen with the decorator parameter frozen equals true. And basically what it means is that it immediately makes your uh, instances uh, immutable. Meaning that whenever you create an object out of uh, cat frozen class, you no longer are allowed to modify it. If you want to modify some data, well, you create a new instance. And again, getting back to uh, data immutability, uh, it is a very good thing, uh, at least in functional programming, what we can learn from functional programming, that when you're dealing with immutable data, your uh, programs tend to be much less complex. Uh, moving further with data immutability. Ditch lists. Instead, use tuples. And uh, the main difference, well, there are more differences uh, between tuples and lists, but the main difference for uh, today's presentation is that uh, lists are mutable and the tuples are immutable. And basically it means like if you have a tuple of five elements, you cannot remove them, you cannot add them, you can only iterate or create new tuples out of your original tuple. And with lists, it's quite, quite a different story. Uh, you can add, remove elements, and do whatever you want. 
Um, so the combination of frozen data classes and tuples makes basically all of your data that you're working with immutable. And uh, again, this forces you to think and architect your code in a completely different way instead of when you're using normal classes and lists that allow you that modification. So it's a totally different uh, approach the way you write software. Okay, moving on, uh, side effects. Uh, what's the difference between these two functions? Well, uh, one function, the, the, the first one, uh, returns simply a string. And the second function uh, prints that string. Well, uh, you could say there isn't much difference between those functions, but uh, there is one fundamental difference. One does not have a side effect, and another one has. The first one is very easy to test. Right? I can, I can simply write a test where I do uh, a string comparison, and I'm done. Now if I want to test the second function, which has a side effect, now it becomes exponentially more difficult. Now I need to catch all the std out stream, uh, store it in a variable, extract that printed characters to the terminal, and then only do that comparison. So side effects are a horrible, horrible uh, uh, productivity killer that makes your code uh, less less maintainable. So again, what we can learn from uh, functional programming, try to avoid side effects at all costs. And once you're, uh, once you're dealing with uh, immutable data, you will find that usually uh, while loops and for loops kind of no longer work uh, once, since you cannot uh, modify your data. Well, you can use for other reasons, but you cannot use for modification reasons. Instead, what you do is you uh, start relying more on uh, functional uh, methods, functional programming methods, such as filter, next, map, and reduce. I'm, I'm not going to go into details explaining uh, what they do. There are many YouTube tutorials that will explain very nicely what are they used for, but uh, again, this is one of your weapons uh, in the functional programming uh, field. Um, and the last, la uh, the last slide on improving your code is not necessarily related to object-oriented or functional programming. It's regarding how clever are you when you are naming your instances. And especially in object-oriented code bases, I see uh, class names like service controller or device manager or file reader and so on. Very complicated, very uh, clever names, and I have no clue what they're doing. Therefore, I have to go to that class, I have to inspect the code, and I need to understand what it's doing. What I found out to, to make my code more readable is when I'm creating classes, I'm trying to uh, find a name that actually exists in the real world. So for example, instead of email manager, you, ha you just have an email. And that email inside can perfectly have a function send, or receive, or whatever, or for example, file, can inside have a function read that can read from something and populate itself. It's like uh, it could be a static method, right? So don't try to be very clever with, uh, with the names, uh, with the class names, and try to think, does that thing exist in real world? Like file, cat, or cow, or, or animal in that sense. Okay. Um, so, the TLDR part of, uh, of my presentation, and it's a very simple message, as everything is fine with object-oriented programming. Just don't try to be clever with it. Okay, and uh, I just want to 
tell you who I am that because this is the last slide uh, I was uh, presenting as a Lyman Asutkos as a fractional uh, CTO, and if you want you know, to say hi, just uh, catch me after this talk, or you can scan this uh, LinkedIn QR code and uh, write a message that way. Uh, I usually help people with their uh, startups, whether it's a, an idea stage, whether it's an early stage startup, or you already have an established startup and you need scaling. Um, so I can, I can help you with that, I can coach you and and yeah, thank you. So it was it was quite fast, right? We expected a longer one. So we have some questions. Yeah, any questions? Uh, yes, you used ABC, the abstract, abstract base class. Can you talk about why you use that? Uh, is there any other way? No. <laughs> no, uh, well, at least uh, the at least the, the way I am aware of, the way you declare abstract classes in Python, you use uh, ABC library uh, because uh, Python by itself does not support abstract classes, right? But there is a library called ABC and uh, it can signify that it's an abstract class and then you have a decorator, again, abstract uh, method and it all, all it comes from the uh, ABC library. Python does not support out-of-the-box abstractions. I have a question. Yes. Uh, let's see, imagine that uh, example you showed that having cow and which is animal, and let's say, uh, what about if we have more layers, which is, let's say, cow is also mammal, then let's say it is uh, species is something more, and then how would you prefer to go like multi- uh, layer of uh, like inheritance is it bad or it should, it should be as less as possible and yeah yeah I understand uh, so the question is about how many layers of abstraction uh, should we have and uh, my answer is the the less the better and uh, sometimes it is really nice to have uh, some abstraction some inheritance like let's say at least one layer of abstraction especially when you are dealing with infrastructure as code. Uh, how many of you know what cloud, uh, no, Terraform, what Terraform is? Okay, some of you. Okay, uh, horrible technology, don't use it. <laughs> uh, if you are in AWS field, uh, use AWS CDK. It's a wrapper around cloud formation. Uh, yeah, it's, it's called cloud formation. It's a, it's a wrapper around cloud formation and uh, you can write Python code, and with Python you can define your infrastructure. And in these very, very specific scenarios, it becomes very nice when you can say that, okay, uh, I have maybe 10 Lambda functions, but some of them are my backend Lambda functions, the ones that can receive calls from API gateway. Well, that is, then it's very nice when I'm creating the definition of a Lambda function, I will pass an inheritance that is a backend function and say that it can already receive uh, requests from uh, an API gateway. But in other scenarios, in more usual application development scenarios, I would uh, suggest go as less as possible with abstraction layers and sometimes you can go even without abstraction layers. Like you can, you can go with your data as flat as you want. You can go, okay, this is the type, this is the subtype, this is the sub-subtype, whatever and everything can be laid down in a nice JSON uh, representation or even better in a, in a frozen data class. So the less abstractions, the better. Yes? Yeah, I have a question about your, just your last statement when you said that I have the function to receive the request from an API gateway. Is there a reason to add it if you can just use both of the and both function? Or do you mean it's like a backend function that's accessible to like yeah, yeah, I, yeah uh, so it's regarding Lambda functions acting as a, as a backend for an API gateway. So whenever you are creating an API gateway and you want a Lambda function to uh, process your requests, uh, the way you connect these two is by adding a certain permission to your Lambda function that it can be invoked by an API gateway service. And that is five lines of code, right? And you don't want to put that five lines of code in every single Lambda function. Uh, you can abstract it out and uh, have 
a base or abstract lambda function, which we'll call backend function, and it has that, those uh, five lines of code as a permission. So I'm not talking about the invocation of a lambda function with both of three. I'm talking about the sandwich of API gateway and the lambda function as a backend. Yes? So instead of abstract classes, you can use protocols? I have no idea what protocols are. So you, you should not use protocols. <laughs> okay, I will definitely look what protocols are. Uh, maybe uh, they solve some of the problems. But again, uh, I think fundamentally when we're talking about abstraction, uh, inheritance, and polymorphism, these things, well, they still exist in, in object-oriented programming, and uh, you shouldn't abuse them. That's, that's the thing, you shouldn't abuse those principles. Yes? Uh, what do you think about uh, identity-based uh, models and then referring to the one? I absolutely love Bidantic <laughs> because it uh, makes it very simple to uh, parse JSONs, uh, especially when you, know, you, you get an API request uh, and then you need to, to parse the data and you can easily parse in the Bidantic. It already gives you uh, all the uh, all the type checking, ensuring that you know the types are correct, uh, and uh, you can do some validation and so on. So I think these are two a little bit different things. I would use Pydantic probably for API handling, uh, like JSON handling and so on, and other data classes when uh, I'm dealing with uh, other data besides the API data. Okay, and I think we're. So we still have some questions in the Discord channel. Sure. Right, so this question is by Futurist. He asks, how would you, how would one adapt self principles using functional patterns? Um, okay, I think this is a little bit uh, two different things: the, the the solid approach and the object-oriented approach, and and then functional approach. Um, Okay, I, I will not answer this question directly, but I will just say that you can achieve solid both in functional and object-oriented uh, pro programming, and it's not a very uh, relevant thing. Another question from Danilo. So, it's a long one. Um, he said, he asks, there was a little bit of manipulation regarding this slide of classes. You said... There I, was. I don't remember what was on the previous slide. But this is an example without context. You cannot create code. Functional or OP programming requires context, and you're skipping it. And the question is, how can we simplify work with the context that we should know instead of simplifying the code? OK, that was a difficult question. <laughs> um, OK, uh, let me try to, to reason as, as simply as possible. Yeah, so definitely uh, there was some uh, uh, code manipulation, let's say, or context manipulation regarding when I showed you the example of uh, abstract factories. Um, but the way I see, and again, this comes from 10 years of uh, software development experience, and I see other projects, I've done this myself before, uh, I've seen other businesses, other teams doing this, is it's not about necessarily the context that I was missing here. It was about to convey the message that more often than not, we are overdoing the object-oriented programming. We are abusing the features it gives us. And the main message here is uh, don't abuse the OOP. Right, last question from Eustimus. Doesn't Zen of Python says explicit is better than implicit? Because device manager class seems quite more descriptive rather than device class. Uh, can you repeat that one? Yeah, so, uh, Zen of Python says explicit is better than implicit. Mm -hmm. Because device manager class seems quite more descriptive rather than device class. Uh, completely disagree. The word manager is an uh, unnecessary word. <laughs> Right, because it says, okay, I'm managing devices. What does it even mean? 
right? So uh, I would instead use simple words as a device which can ma manage itself, and a device manager, you know, as as the word manager or, or controller or anything doesn't really doesn't really add anything to the explicitness of your of your code. Yep. Okay. So thank you, everyone.